Um, as a young person and hearing the call of God, many of you have heard this story before, but I was at a children's camp at nine years old, and we went to that camp, and you know how camp is for kids. You're excited about all the different aspects of activities and other fun stuff you're going to do, but we, um, we, we went into a chapel service one night and had a service, and we began to see the Spirit of God move in that place, and when the Spirit of God begins to move in front of a child, how many of you guys know that spiritual hunger gets stirred up on the inside? And I was already filled with the Holy Spirit. I'd already been born again, but I saw what God was doing in that place. And when those miracles began to happen, kids began to get filled with the Holy Spirit. It was like a dinner bell was being rung for God stirring my heart, saying, you need to step up to the plate. So I was sitting over on one side of the room, and I lifted up my hands to the Lord, and I said, Lord, Whatever you want me to do, I want to do for you. And not two seconds later, the Spirit of God spoke to me right down in here in my spirit and said, Jeremiah, I want you to tell boys and girls all around the world about me. I began to see a picture of myself in, in a vision form in my mind of me telling kids, my friends, other people about Jesus. That night, there was a slew of kids down at the altars that were praying and asking to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I stepped out from that point and said, Lord, you said you want to use me. Let's do it now. So I stepped down there, and uh, there was 14, 15, 16 other boys in my bunkhouse. A bunch of them wanted to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That night, I stepped down and began to lay hands on them and pray for them. One by one by one, all those boys started to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I saw God wasn't just speaking to me, saying, wait till later. He'd use me now. I went back home from summer camp, and my children's pastor at the time, uh, shared with my parents what had happened to me and um, actually after that service was over that night the um, the speaker that was speaking was a guest speaker I uh, went up and told him what God had done in my heart and he took me and put his big old arms around my head and gave me one of those little noogies on the top of the head and he pointed his finger in my face and with confidence in his eyes he looked at me and he said Jeremiah I believe with all of my heart God's going to use you just like he said he would do you know what? There's been difficult times down through the years where people have not believed in the call of God on my life or tried to discourage me and stuff like that. But you know what I remember? I remember General Roy Evans pointing his finger in my face and saying, I believe God's going to use you just like he said he would. I believe that with all of my heart. You know, then I went back to the church and began to get involved in ministry, doing whatever I could. Uh, doing puppets, cleaning up trash after children's church, doing whatever I could, serving in that way. But then when Pastor Van came to the church and, and God brought him to be a part of the ministry there, he did something different than all the other people had done before. And you see it in the ministry here at Brownsville with the kids being released to do what God's called them to do. A lot of times there's just little bits of responsibility somebody will release a kid to do, but they never really trust them. They, they, they're afraid of what might happen. And I'm not saying you just need to let everybody go and just do whatever they want to. But he poured into me and put me under his arm and poured into me and poured into me. And then he did what nobody else had ever done before. He began to release me to exercise those gifts and those callings and that ability that God had placed on the inside of me. Pastor Van, I'm so thankful that you did that. That was the making and changing uh, uh, changing of my life when you did that for me. And I just want to say to everybody here today, there's kids in your church that are just like that. There's kids that have the gifts and the callings of God on the inside of them, and they are just waiting for somebody to believe in them, to recognize that, and to begin to disciple them and then release them to do what God's called them to do. How many of you want to have that in your church? You want to see God do that? Would you stand up on your feet? We're going to pray before we get started today. And uh, just lift up your hands and let's just open our hearts to the Lord today and say, Lord, whatever you want to do, do it in my life today. Lord, we lift our hands. We lift our voices to you, Lord God. And we thank you, Jesus. You are the head of the church. We thank you that you're in control of the things that happen in our church. But Lord, we yield ourselves to you fully and completely. Lord God, we open our hearts 
hearts to you. And Lord, we thank you you would open our eyes to see those precious kids that you brought into our body, brought into our children's church. Lord, we thank you, Lord God, that we'll see them through your eyes. And Father God, as we disciple them and as we pour your word into them, Father, we thank you that you'll help us to release them, to maximize their giftings and potential and abilities, and to release them to do the work that you've already called them to do. Lord, open our eyes to see clearly and to put this into practice today. And we give you thanks and praise for the eternal fruit that will be brought in the kingdom of God. Lord, I thank you today that you'll help me to step into the background. Father, I thank you that you'll step into the foreground. Lord, use my meager words, Lord God, uh, and speak through me and help me to convey what you put in my heart clearly. Thank you for the anointing in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to say today, like I said the other day, we live in a world that the enemy has not waited to offer counterfeits to our kids for the power of God. We live in a world where the enemy doesn't wait till a kid gets grown up to try to offer him his plan and his purpose. I was brokenhearted last week. I stepped into our Christian school at our church, and a man came up to him and said, Pastor, did you hear what happened to a kid over at another Christian or a a good community school, it's a, one of the better schools in our city. There was a little first grade girl that um, went to the bathroom. Someone um, in the sixth grade pulled that little girl aside, molested her in her very own school last week in Montgomery, Alabama. The enemy doesn't wait to try to ruin and destroy kids' lives. Last night we saw the thing with Marilyn Manson. Do you think the enemy was waiting on him? No. He was beginning at the very earliest of age to begin to lay strongholds in that young man's mind to keep him from following God's plan and purpose for his life. The enemy's after the kids. You see it in the way people even spend their money nowadays. They are after the minds and the hearts of young people. Why do we as the church want to sit back and not go after those precious and tender hearts that are waiting to be molded and shaped for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you know what the enemy doesn't like when kids get filled with the Spirit and the power of God? He's already tasted it time and time and time again. Think about in the Old Testament when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the Hebrew children, he had a plan that he wanted to try to cut their lives off. But those young men were filled with the power of God and the tables were completely turned on the enemy. He hates it when kids are anointed and filled by the Spirit to do work. Think about old David as, uh, as a young man, as a shepherd boy. God using Samuel to anoint him as the king over Israel. And then David doing what God called him to do, going up to fight that old Philistine giant that was standing against God's people. The enemy hates it when kids get a vision of what God wants them to do and then get anointed with that power to step out and do it. He's had, his, he's had trouble with that from the very beginning of time. He doesn't want to see it happen, and I don't want to let him have his plan succeed. I want to begin to release kids to do what God's called them to do. Let's keep giving the devil fits over and over again. Esther, think about Esther and the story of God's people being preserved. She was a young lady. God sent her for such a time as this to be a deliverer for God's people and to help them. And so the enemy doesn't like it when young people get anointed to do a task for what uh, uh, God's called them to do. He hates that. He hates it when young people uh, find out God's plan. You know what? Some people don't even believe God does have a plan. I want you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. Open your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 1. Does God wait till young people are older till he has a plan for them? Jeremiah 1, 5 says this, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. God is no respecter of persons. He had a plan for Jeremiah. You know what? Every single young person in your church, God has a plan for their life. He's got something he wants them to do. He wants them to be uh, equipped to do the work he's called them to do. Think with me just a minute about the story of David. David was probably 16, 17, 18 years old when Samuel the prophet came to visit old Jesse's house. Jesse was looking at the outward appearance, and you remember how he went through all of the different sons and said, 
Lord, would this be the one that you would have me to anoint as king over Israel? And every one, God said no. God said no. Came on down the line, and there was one other son who was out in the field, old David. He was watching the sheep, and he called for uh, him to come in, and David came in. David, God said through Samuel that this is the one that I've anointed to be king over Israel. Man looks at the outward appearance. What does God look at? God looks at the heart. And so David, at 17, 18 years old, he was made aware of a plan God had for him that he didn't step into until some 15, 17 years later when he became king over Israel. There was a whole process of preparation, God preparing him to do what God called him to do. And David was faithful in that area. We live today in a world, I, I'm amazed. If you'll go in and minister to kids, kids that are open and hungry for the truth, they're looking to find the answer for their life. They've got this, we live in this fatherless generation as Mark talked about last night. Kids need to know the power of God's love. They want to know the truth. If we'll just go out there and give them the truth, they're ready and willing to receive. The second thing I want you to see today is if our kids don't find God's plan for their life, they're going to live, not, not be able to live their life to the full potential. They'll live a life of mediocrity. They'll live a life constantly looking for something else to satisfy, something else to make them feel more fulfilled. And I'll tell you, what makes a person happy and fulfilled is when they have a vision in their heart and they know what God wants them to do. All of you know the scripture in Proverbs 29, 18. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, Berkeley's translation says, people run wild. You wonder today why young people are chasing after all these different things. They have no vision of what God wants them to do. They go from one thing to the next. You ask a kid one day what they want to do, and they say they want to do this. You ask them another day, and they're completely chasing after something so far from what would help them to step towards the thing they told you the day before because they don't have a vision. They want to work up a plan in their mind, but they don't have a vision in their heart of what they can be with God and his power on the inside. Let me tell you this. As a nine-year-old kid, I was a kid. Just because you're, you have something on the inside of you spiritually doesn't mean you automatically become completely mature in spiritual things. Do you understand that? When I knew God called me to be a children's pastor, I didn't understand all the reasons why I needed to follow Jesus with all of my heart. I knew I needed to do that, but I didn't understand why. Do you know what kept me focused and moving in the right direction? is I had a picture of what God wanted me to be. And even at a 9, 10, 11 years old, I could ask myself questions. Is this helping me to get through what God wants me to do? Is this helping me to be what God wants me to be? I've never smoked a cigarette before. Why? Well, as a young person, I just knew children's pastors didn't smoke cigarettes. You understand that? I didn't have this deep revelation that my body was a temple of the Holy Ghost and all of this, you know, I, I just knew my children's pastor didn't smoke a cigarette. I better not do that. You know, I knew that children's pastors don't do drugs. They don't drink alcohol. Did I have this deep thing down in my spirit? No, I had a vision of where I was going, and was that helping me to get to what God's called me to do? I wanted to have the more that God had for me. I wanted to have his plan and his purpose, so I needed to follow those steps so it helped me to get there. I was blessed a few years ago to go to focus on the family in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and be a part of, of the ministry there. If you've never um, heard of Dr. Dobson and what goes on at Focus on the Family, a tremendous ministry reaching out to hurting people. And um, when we were there, Dr. Dobson actually suffered a stroke. If you were, if you, those of you who remember that, it was during the time I was there. And, and um, you know, seeing the prayers of the saints come in, and watch how God miraculously just turned the whole thing around. We were blessed to be there at the same time. Staff was all told that um, Dr. Dobson had suffered a stroke and may never be able to speak again, um, never be able to direct the ministry that God had given to him. And then one day there was a, a, a United Chapel service for all of the staff that began to lift up their voices and worship God as they did out the back walk Dr. Dobson just seven days after he'd suffered a stroke, just a few days, came in should have seen the power of God just come down that place across the domination. There's women that just fell into the power of God right there. The power of God was so strong 
he got up and began to speak what doctors told him just a week before he wouldn't be able to do. It was amazing. But he got up, and, and uh, during the time of me being there and getting to hear about him, that man had a vision and a, and a heart like I've never seen before, and he also had a discipline. He's the most disciplined man I think I've ever met in my life. They told him after he'd suffered the heart attack, even before he had a stroke, that uh, uh, Dr. Dobson, you don't need to eat any more fatty food. You just need to stay away from the fat that um, you know, has fat. So how many of you know we do need some fat as healthy for us? And Dr. Dobson took it so literally what they said, no fat, that he didn't eat anything. He knew what God called him to do, and he wanted to take care of his body. He had a vision of where he was going. So he didn't eat any fat, went back to the doctor for a checkup after a while. They said to him, what, what are you doing? What's not right? And they, he said, you know, I hadn't been eating any fat. I did what I told him to. And they said, no, 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 no. You need to eat some. Don't completely just forsake it all. But just to have a discipline like that, to lay off the ice cream, children's pastors. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> to step back from those late night snacks that you run in and grab. There's a discipline that follows a vision. And that man demonstrated that to me when I heard about that. When you give kids a vision of what they can be, there's going to be a discipline that follows that. They'll be able to run with what God's put in their heart, and they'll be able to stay focused. You know, a picture motivates kids. When they can see what they can be, they, they, they can run towards that. They can follow after that. The promises of God of what we can be are always coupled with our actions, too. We've got to be willing to to make commitments to the things of God if we're going to see the rewards God promises. In Joshua chapter 1, it talks about the blessings that the Lord wants to bring to us. But it says, if you'll meditate on my word, then you shall make your way prosperous. There's all these things that we've got to do. We've got to make a commitment to follow after the things of God. Now, where does all this start from? We've got to start in the very beginning by training kids that they can be used by God. We've got to start in the very beginning by instilling into them that God has a plan for their life. Proverbs 22, 6, it says this, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. How many of you people have heard that scripture quoted the wrong way before? You've heard people say, Train up a child in the way he should go. When he goes off, he'll come back again. Is that what that scripture says? No, if they're trained up right, they'll never depart from the things of God. If you'll instill into them a heart for the Lord and the things of God, they'll never, ever walk away. We today don't understand what training actually is. We confuse training with verbal instruction. You know how people say, do as I say, not as I do? People are willing to tell kids what to do, but they're not willing to take the time to train them. A few years ago, I was in a hotel, and it was in September, and there was a Jewish family that was celebrating Rosh Hashanah in the hotel. There was a little 10-year-old boy that was outside, and I've always been fascinated by the feast days and all the things surrounding the feast and the symbolism of the things that are tied back to the church. So I sat down with this little 10-year-old boy, and I began to ask him about the feast that they were celebrating and the feast days and the holiday and all of this kind of stuff. He began to tell me detail by detail what each little thing meant. Have you ever heard the story about the promise of the father and how in a Jewish household they'll take a little piece of bread, they'll wrap it up in a cloth, and the father will take that little piece of bread and he'll go and hide it in the house. Then the children have to go looking for the promise of the father. You see the symbolism there? You know the Jewish people are wonder, wonderful about that after being separated and not having a homeland for their people and being dispersed all over the world, after over 1,500 years of time like that, they could still come together as a pure race of people. Why could they do that? Because they kept their, uh, their, what God had put in their heart close to them. They would kept it. Genesis 18, 19, God chose to establish his covenant with Abraham. Why did he do that? Because the Bible says he would knew, knew that he would command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. You can't just say things to kids. You've got to train them. How does training happen? You've got to keep instilling things into them over and over and over again. Those holidays that the Jewish people celebrate, it doesn't happen just once a year. They have those feast days and holidays that they celebrate all the time. 
and they honor them. No wonder their kids live and are able to follow out what they've been put in their heart because they drilled it in here, drilled it in here. We've got to do the same thing. We've got to give our kids the truth of the Word of God. We've got to pour God's Word in them and a love for the Father so they'll never, ever, ever, ever depart. What's the most effective way to train kids if you're training kids for service in the kingdom of God? You can see pictures of this, Sam, and Elisha and Elijah, but I think Jesus was the greatest at training and releasing people to do what God had called him to do. They, uh, Jesus came to this earth in Ephesians 4.11. It talks about how Jesus gave gifts or God gave gifts to men. When Jesus came to this earth, first of all, he drafted disciples. You know, as a children's pastor, you're going to see kids in your church. You're going to see little girls that are worshiping God, lifting their hand, and they're praying in the Spirit, and they're beginning to release the mysteries of God out of their mouth. You're going to see that. And you may say, we need some prayer, or we need some altar work. We need some prayer team members. And you know what? There's some kids that will never respond. They'll never come forward like that. You've got to go after them. Be willing to go out and draft them. Jesus didn't have a single volunteer among the 12 disciples. He went out and drafted all of them. He said, you come follow me. You as a children's pastor, a children's leader, you've got to go after kids and say, come follow me as I follow Christ. What is, a disciple, what is making a disciple all about? You taking somebody that's unchristlike, putting them around somebody that's Christlike, and letting their Christlikeness rub off on that other person. You bring those people to uh, that place by drawing them in. Jesus drafted his disciples. Then what did he do? He ministered to his disciples. You can't minister unless you first receive. The Bible says, freely you have received, freely give. If kids, all they've been is drafted, but they've never had the word of God poured into them, they're going to have nothing to say. They're going to have nothing to give. They've got to be willing to receive. Jesus ministered and he poured himself into those 12 men. He took them out from that point in there, and he let them follow him and watch him minister. Jesus was an example before them about how to do things. After they watched him for a little bit of time, Jesus released them to go out and do some things. Do you remember how he sent them out to cast the demons out of the little boy, the man's son? And they came back and they said, Jesus, we can't do this. Jesus had to teach them again. He said, it's because of your doubt and unbelief. You've got to believe. You've got to stand on the word of God. And so he had to train them. He was modeling. He released them. They messed up. He said, you didn't do that right. Come back and let's try this again. You've got to be willing to let these kids follow after you and watch you minister and then release them. And then the last thing Jesus did is Jesus released the disciples to do the work of the ministry. He was here on the earth ministering for just a number of years. But then Jesus left. But because he poured himself into those disciples, the ministry of Jesus still happening today. People are duplicating themselves, pouring themselves into others. The gospel is being spread all over the world. What Jesus did was multiplied when he let those 12 disciples go. So we've got to be first willing to go after those kids that God's called. We've got to minister into their lives. We've got to let them follow along after us, hang on to our coattails and follow us around for a little bit. Then we've got to release them to do what God's called them to do in the very first place. We need to train our kids not only to live for Jesus, but we need to give them an opportunity to serve. Give them a place to exercise the gifts and abilities God's given to them. Do you know what? It's amazing, not amazing to me to imagine, but do you know who is the quickest to pick up foreign languages and to learn things? Who do you think they are? Kids. If people are learning how to play a musical instrument, who do you think learns faster how to pick up all of those sounds and learns how to play? quicker than anybody else. Children, pick up. It's the way God created them. They're created to learn and to receive and to, to take things in so that they can begin to practice what they've learned. So we've got to learn how to train our kids. We need to give them an opportunity, first of all, to discover their calling. When you minister in our church, I, I because I was called of the Lord at a young age, I'm always talking about God has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for you. I do like Pastor Van does and talk about how, you know, there's plans out there that are little plans, but God, he's got a great big old plan. How many of you guys want the little bitty? I can even use it with an object lesson and pull out. I, I went to a, 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 a drug store and saw the 
giant box of Oreo cookies, you know, the big display boxes. And I talk about how man's plans and your own ideas of what God can use you to do are so small. And I'll take out a little old box of Oreo cookies and say, this is what it's like. But you know what? If you'll discover God's plan, he's got a big old plan. And I'll pull out that big old box of Oreo cookies after I've talked for a while. Those kids are drooling at the mouth. But they're also catching that they can be what God wants them to be. That he has something so much bigger for them than they have for themselves. So we've got to be willing to train them. Help them discover their calling. We need to be an example before them. Take them and let them see what you're doing. Let them see you living for Christ. You know what? Oftentimes parents get most upset about and their kids about are the things that they see in their kids that they see in themselves. When they look at that kid and they get angry at them, shame on you, parent. You've been that example before them. You see them doing what you do, then you fuss at them and get on to them. You know, I had a friend one time that his kid was acting up and doing something, and the dad looked at him and said, where did you learn to do that from? He said, Dad, you do it all the time. I just slapped you upside the face, won't it? You've got to be an example to the kids of what you want them to be. And then you need to allow them to work alongside of you. Then encourage them. The disciples had to keep following Jesus. They could have given up that day and said, Jesus, we messed up, we blew it, I'm going back. You know, I don't know if you can use me anymore. But no, they, they determined they were going to be faithful to follow Jesus. Encourage your kids to be faithful. Don't let them give up on you. You know, there's some young, young men that God's given um, me and, and the church that I met. One of the young men's here with me. He's back in the back, Jordan Ridby. And when I came to the church, actually before I even came, um, I went back to my home church to see the children's pastor. And Jordan, I don't even know if you know this, but Jordan's mom wrote me a little letter while I was still in Oklahoma. She told me that uh, Jordan was just anxious to be used by God. He just wanted to serve you. Jordan, I think you were, were you 12 when I got to Montgomery? Had you already turned 13? You were 12? 12, is that right? He was 12. When I got to Montgomery, the very first day, I hit, hit the ground running and got re getting ready for church on Sunday morning. I had my service planning sheet and all the order of worship. The children's pastor before me, um, his, his service was real dry. Always the same thing every week. Real, almost traditional. What was in a, just an order, and the kids could tell you the next word he could say right after said the last word, you know, and uh, I gave Jordan this order of service, and he, he was just anxious to be used, and he, he was panicking, because here we are, we've got all these different segments in the service, and different things to flow through, and he's back in the sound booth, running sound for me, and just praying that he can make it through this day, because I got this skit, and this video, and this object lesson, and coming at all this, and he's just thinking, my goodness, what is this guy going to do? But Jordan stepped right in and started to help me and be a part, and I started to pour myself into him and, and uh, encourage him and give him an opportunity to be used. You know, there's other young men in our church that they come along and they help for a little bit, and then for some reason, they start to pull away. They start to get discouraged, or something happens. You know what, you as a leader, don't give up on those guys. You need to go out to them, reach out to them, have that heart of the Father, and don't let them uh, walk away or get discouraged. Or um, You know, you may never know what they're carrying on the inside of the heart. You be open to that and develop a relationship with those young people that you can encourage them to be faithful. You can't just preach that. You've got to be an example of that. If you know those kids know you love them and what uh, you're telling them to do is for their best, They'll listen to you. If you just stand up and preach faithfulness and you don't live it, they're not going to receive that. They want to know that you love them, and then they'll follow you wherever you go. So reach out and teach the kids to be faithful in what God's called them to do. And then, like I said before, release them to do what God's called them to do. There's two callings in the Word of God. And when I was getting ready to go to Bible school, I was actually 17 years old when I moved to Oklahoma. And when I was getting ready to go to Oklahoma to go to Bible school, um, I felt like the Lord had told me to do that because someone else spoke into my life some things that I needed to hear at that point in time. At 15 and 16, Pastor Van, you probably remember this, I was gung-ho ready to go. I thought I was, I was supposed to be the next children's pastor after Pastor Van in some ways. You know, I was excited about what God called me to do. But there's two callings. There's a call to prepare, and then there's a call to go. 
I was hearing the call to get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. But you know what I thought I was supposed to be doing? I thought I was supposed to be doing that, that God called me to do at that point in time. And you know what? I was wrong about that. Somebody was able to point that out to me, and I first needed to prepare, and then I would be ready to go and do what God called me to do. So there's kids that are needing to receive preparation, and then once they've been faithful in that preparation time, God can say, now, hear the call to go. Moses, you know what? I really think when he uh, was raised up at that point where he, he, he killed the Egyptian, I think he sensed the call of God that God wanted to use him to be delivered for the children of Israel, but he, he acted a little bit prematurely. He was taking things into his own hands. God said, Moses, no, you got some things you need to learn. He had to spend some time out in the wilderness learning how to follow God. He had to receive the preparation. Then God could say, all right, Moses, now go back and do what I've called you to do. Then he went forth in strength because he'd received what God had, had given him to do. The more people you develop, let me tell you this, the greater the influence and the greater fulfillment of the dreams you'll see come to pass. My heart is not just to see my church grow and the kids in my church be blessed, but I want to see people all over the world reach for Christ. And if I'm pouring into these other young people, you know what? Someday I'll be able to step aside and look and see the influence that's been spread all across the world because of releasing people uh, and pouring myself and pouring God's word into them. So pour yourself into the people. The last thing that I want to encourage you to do is to develop fruit that remains. You uh, uh, see children's pastors all the time, and it's a crying shame. They want to build a children's ministry all around their personality and all around everything while they're at that church. Children's workers are the worst about doing things all by themselves. They try to do things with them and their wife and their family. They want to do it all themselves. But you need to learn to release people in, into what God's called them to do. In our children's ministry, we have... Um, 12 key leaders that God's given us to, uh, to serve in areas. There are people that are over our, our helps ministries. There's people that are over our inner city ministry, people that's over our missions education program, all the different aspects of the ministry. And those people are people that God's sent and raised up in our church to lead in the way that he, he's brought them in. A few months ago, actually September of last year, I was down at the altars. I was praying. There was a man that came and spoke in our church about change. And the whole service, the Spirit of God was kicking me in the chest. The whole service, the Spirit of God was dealing with my heart about something. Because we've been doing something in our church that wasn't connecting with our kids. We were doing something, and I'm, I'm not telling you this is what you need to do. I'm just going to share with you what God laid on my heart to do at this point in time. We were doing something in our church that was relatively successful, but not doing what God wanted to be doing. It was a program called Royal Rangers and Missionettes. We had leaders who had no vision for anything with the Royal Rangers and Missionettes. The program was dying. Our kids were receding. They weren't growing. They were hating coming to church. And so I could have tried to rework that program and come at it from a different aspect. But I realized my key to, to that program growing was leaders that had a vision and a heart for reaching kids. So I went down to the altar. I was a little afraid and discouraged about what I was going to do. Um, one of the things that bothered me at the time was our 15-year missionette coordinator would, had just come on staff as my secretary. And so, you know, I knew how much she believed in missionettes. And I was afraid, you know, here she comes and then we're going to, you know, you know, make these changes. And I didn't know what was going to happen. But when I got down, I came off the platform and got to the altars. I think I was the first person down on my face. And when I got down on my face before God, God said to me, he said, you don't do what I've called you to do. There's adults and people in this church that will never be what I've called them to be. They'll never fulfill their destiny and their plan for their life if you don't obey me. Obedience calls for sacrifice, doesn't it? That altar is not a place of receiving. That's a place of laying things down and, and being obedient and sacrificing. So you know what we did? We obeyed God. We took it in steps. We started doing one of the things the Lord had laid on my heart is giving our kids a heart for missions. We started a missions education program that meets on the first Wednesday night of every month. When those kids come in on Wednesday nights, it's decorated for whatever part of the country we're talking about. When they come in, the last month we talked about Russia because we just got back from Russia. The kids came in. Actually, we just did Scotland. I'm sorry. 
Scotland, and one of our missionaries in our church was actually there that night from Scotland, Philip Cameron, if any of you know Philip. Philip was there that night. We had Scottish music playing, and we have the food the kids can taste, and we talk about what's going on in the orphanages and in the different things that Philip does through his ministry over there, giving the kids a heart for missions. Do you know what? Our biggest attendance night started to be in, I'm not saying this is all about numbers, but when our kids started to connect with what was going on, they started showing up in droves. We saw our, our kids start coming out to be a part of what we were doing with the, the Wednesday night program for missions. Our kids gave $500 to missions in 1998, 1999. But I'm thrilled to say we've put a heart for missions in our kids this year. And our kids have raised this year almost $6,000 for world missions through various projects. I obeyed God and the blessings came. I had to do what God called me to do. The next thing the Lord laid on my heart after taking the step with that was to do something else. He said, I want what you're doing with the kids. I want you to, them to be able to live out what you're preaching. There, it's good to have memory of work and memorize the word of God. And, and there's a place for that. But the Lord told me on Wednesday nights, I want you almost as if you were saying getting their faces about what, what uh, they need to be doing. We wanted to put, make things practical. And so we started a program, and right now we're teaching our kids about absolute truth. We talked this last week about purity. God is pure, so you need to be pure. He doesn't ask you to be anything that violates his character. He wants you to be like him, and if you'll be like him, you'll experience all the rewards of, of following after him. Fifth and sixth graders, I got to go speak and minister to them. Do you know what? Those kids are understanding what purity is all about. We're relating to them, and our kids are being changed. you got to be willing to obey God and follow after Him. Don't get stuck in a rut. Don't keep doing something just because you've done it before. Obey God, and you'll see the rewards like you've never seen before. So step out and be obedient to what God has called you to do. you got to be faithful in that, and God will bring blessings. I said all that to tell you about the leadership, though. Those people that God's brought along, do you know how excited they are? My missions education coordinator, she came in my office the other day. Big old tears running down her face. She's a homeschool mom. She said, Pastor Jeremiah, if I could, this would be all I'd ever do. She said, I know I need to, I need to do what I'm doing with my kids. And she almost asked me like this. She said, do you think it'd be all right once my kids grow up if I just did this all the time? You know, she's just gotten a heart. Would, she, would I have ever found that heart? if I'd not been willing to pour into somebody else, if I was trying to do it all by myself. There's other people in your church you need to be willing to pour into. Develop that team around you and those other people, the other adults to step into the gifts and the ministry God's called them to do, all right? So we want to develop a fruit that remains. How are you going to do that? I'm going to give you uh, nine ideas that you can take to help develop fruit that remains in your church. First thing you can do is provide places for your kids to serve. Provide places for your kids to serve. Everything that we want our kids to be as an adult, we're going to teach them how to do it as a kid. I want our kids to worship God in spirit and in truth. So what do we do? We teach our, uh, our, our adults to worship God in spirit and truth. What do we do? We teach our kids how to be worshipers. We want our kids to be givers. We want them to grow up with a lifetime of commitment and giving and supporting the work of the kingdom. So what do we do? As a kid, we pour into them that giving. We have an offering lesson at every service to teach the kids. Give them faith for giving. Tell them why it's important that they give. We want our kids to be involved in world missions. We want them to realize that they need to be world Christians, not United States Christians. We want them to realize that they need to be thinking about the world. We want to give them a vision for that. We want our kids to do a number of things. So what do we do? We develop those things that are going to help them to grow to become that. We want to have uh, our kids to be trained to serve in big church. So everything that they are going to be asked to do in big church, we teach them how to do in children's church. Just like Pastor Van does, we have ushers, we have greeters, we have altar workers, we have prayer team, we have sound and media workers, we have praise and worship team. We have all of these different aspects of ministry, and these kids learn how to serve. Then when they grow up and they go into the big church and they say, have you ever worked sound before? 
Yes, I have. I've got 15 years experience helping Pastor Jeremiah. You guys laughed last night when Mark was talking about Chris. Maybe someday he can be a praise and worship leader. You think there's pastors all over America that would just die to have him work in their church. You know what I'm saying? You are going to have to develop fruit that remains, and that's going to come by letting kids have a place to serve. Another ministry we started in, um, at our church, our puppet team was... Uh, just limited in what they could do. So we took uh, and changed the whole format of our puppet team. We did something we called the Creative Ministries Team. We take the things like that are done with the, the uh, ribbons and the banners, and we take the things that are done with puppets and drama and, and all the different aspects of cre the creative art forms, and we teach the kids how to serve in that area. What kids do I use in that area most often? Fifth and sixth graders. Some fourth graders come in. Those kids are my kids I'm going to pour into. You ask me who my 12 disciples were in my church, I'd tell you they're my 14 kids on the creative ministries team because I'm going to take them and we're going to serve together. We're going to believe God. We had a big day last Sunday at our church where we were pushing to have 2,000 people at church. We were believing God for 200 kids. You know what we had? We had 260 kids at church last Sunday, more kids than our church has ever had on a Sunday morning for our uh, for a service. And you know what we did on Saturday night when we were practicing? We didn't just learn how to do the, the human video we were going to do at church the next day. You know what we did? Those kids are my prayer warriors. We walked up and down the aisles. We laid hands on every chair in that place. I could just stand back. It was a joy and watch them to begin to speak the word of God and to call souls into the kingdom of God. We had 31 kids give their heart and life to Jesus last week just in our children's church. And that's a result of those kids praying and believing God for that. And so you, you have opportunities you can pour into kids. Take some time, though, as a pastor and choose some kids that you can pour into. Jesus had the 12 disciples. He had the three. Then he had the one that was the closest to him. You need to develop those relationships around you. Those kids that are on the creative ministries team, it's not amazing to me that most of them want to be in the ministry someday. They want to be pastors teachers, evangelists, missionaries. Why? Because that ministry is an aspect of them getting to learn how to present the gospel in a form that's comfortable to them. If they can get behind a stage and do a puppet 45 times, then next time they get out in front of a group of people, they won't be as nervous. They can stand up and speak because they've learned how to, how to present the gospel in one form or fashion. So the kids can grow in that. So give kids a place to serve. The next thing you need to do is preach and teach about being involved in the work of the ministry and being a soul winner. Don't ever uh, uh, forget that. Kids need to hear things over and over again. All the time I'm talking to my kids about how to, to love that fatherless generation that's all around them, about how to influence people with the love of Christ. I was so thrilled the other day, one of my little girls in children's church, she's eight years old, she came up and she pulled on my coat. She said, Pastor Jeremiah, I want to tell you something. She said, you know how you've been telling us we need to get ready to invite somebody that doesn't know Jesus to church for the, for the big day so they can ask Jesus in their heart? I said, yeah, I sure do. She said, you know what we've been doing? Me and my mama and daddy and my sisters, we've been doing something really neat. Every time on Friday when the trash men come around, what we do is we take out a little ice chest and we put cold drinks down in there and they put them out by the street with a little note and just telling them, this is for you. We know you're having a hot day and uh, we just wanted to let, let you know we're thinking about you. They started doing that. Virginia Lee got so excited. She said, I'm not just going to put drinks out. I'm going to start making little cookies and doing little stuff like that. This little eight-year-old. So she started putting little cookies out. What do you think those garbage men are thinking? They pull up. There's a there's drinks waiting on them. There's a little little table she's set up, and she's got cookies out there. And so anyway, she's doing all this. They come up. They go on vacation a few weeks ago. But guess who's willing to pull their trash can all the way up to the back door and put it exactly where they want it to be? Those trash men started doing that. Uh, well, anytime you're out of town, let us know. We'll be glad to do anything. You need to feed the dog. Da -da -da -da, start to do it. <laughs> And she came to me and she said, Pastor Jeremiah, she's looking at me. She's telling me what I've already preached to her. She said, do you think, you think those people aren't going to come to church when I invite them to come with me? She said, I know they're going to come because they know I love them and they know I care about them. 
and then they're going to come and hear about Jesus and they're going to get saved. Preach and teach to your kids what they can be, what they can do. Share the stories. All the time you hear good things happen and you never get up and tell anybody else about them. Tell your kids what other kids are doing. A little kid is hanging on the monkey bars upside down and he leads one of his other friends to Jesus. Tell the kids about that. On the, on the playground, on the monkey bars, Hunter led so-and-so to Jesus the other day. He was being used by God. So let the kids see that. Preach and teach and help them to develop that heart to be a soul winner, all right? The next thing you can do is believe in your kids. People become what the most important people in their lives think they will become. Pastor Van, I don't know if you remember this, but there was a children's workers meeting years ago at our church. And for some reason, I think it was motivated by the devil, but I don't know for sure. People in this meeting said, started saying things about me. My mom was in that meeting that night, and I don't know if you remember that or not. It was at somebody's house, and they started talking about me and saying that I was too big for my britches. Now, I, I, I could get a little out there sometimes and do some crazy things, but they started to just criticize and, and uh, say things about me. And you know what? My mom came back, and she, she began to ask me questions about if I'd done this and done that. People were making up stuff about me and saying things that weren't true. There was one person that actually, I think, felt threatened that, that as a kid I was going to take over something they were doing, you know, and so they were speaking things. Don't, don't, don't ever say and discourage a kid. That's what it's all about is raising the kids up to do the work God's called them to do. They need to have, uh, hear people believing in them and encourage them. You know, when people that love you come up and say something to you and tell you that you're a loser or you're not going to be what God's called you to be or you're crazy, that feeds on a kid. They need to hear the people that love them and care about them encourage him. I told you, I still remember that big old chubby face pointing his finger in my face and saying, Jeremiah, I believe that God's going to use you to do that. I believe God's going to use you to tell kids all over the world about Jesus. That was an encouragement to me. So believe in your kids. When you have an opportunity to, to get upset and, and or you need to correct them about something, correct them. Help them get on the right track, but then let them know you believe in them. Encourage them and, and edify them after the fact. All right, number four, set time aside to spend with your kids. Set time aside in smaller group settings. You can't do this discipleship thing mass. you got to take time to pull people aside and pour yourself into them. Those things that we're doing on Wednesday nights, I love it because on Wednesday night I could go into a room with 23 fifth and sixth graders and I could get right in their face and talk about them guarding their hearts and living pure lives. I could look right at kids and a little girl just broke down crying right while I was in the middle of talking because I said, Holly, if you'll keep your heart for Jesus. He's got better for you than you could ever ask for yourself. And she just began to weep. I said, when you get married someday, you stand before your husband, you can live a life of no regrets if you've kept your heart pure before the Lord. And she just began to weep because I was able, could I do that in a big old crowd the same as if I'm speaking to a smaller group? No, it'd be different. You need to have time set aside to spend with your kids. You know, you take kids off, too. Pastor Van went to Australia um, a few years ago. And guess what? I got to go with him. He took me along. And you know what? All that time, he's pouring things into me, putting things into my life and encouraging me and helping me to grow in the call of God on my life. So take time aside to, to pour into kids. Bringing Jordan along with me, I wanted to be able to have some time for him to see God moving and what God's doing in other churches and around other places. And opportunity to pour into his life. Take kids aside and, and, and do that and, and um, pour into their life. Number five, you need to do this. You need to teach parents their rightful place in instilling in their kids the vision and the heart and encouraging them. If my dad all the time was coming back to me and saying, son, you're never going to be a children's pastor. You're probably going to be a telephone man just like me. You'll probably never do anything great for God. Do you think uh, I would have a lot of struggles to be going up against. If you're teaching them something at church and the parents are undermining that when they go back home, you know, there's going to be a lot those kids have to go against. It all begins in the home. What Mark was saying last night about the fatherless generation, it's got to start with families. So why not take the time, children's leader, to pour into the moms and dads? There's moms and dads that just don't know how important their job is. They've not realized I'd even encourage taking that message that Mark preached and getting that back into some of the families in your church and letting them catch the vision of where our world's going today. 
when people are neglecting their kids, they're losing them. They're going to hell, and nobody seems to care. They've got to, they've got to go after their kids and influence them. So teach parents that they can do it, that they can encourage their kids. And uh, I'm so glad my parents stayed rooted in the church where they were at. Just a few, um, over the last few months, we've had some problems with different family, friends of ours. And um, when, when these different things have happened, one of the things that the Lord spoke to me about was that these families got mad and disappointed in things, and they uprooted right in the time when their kids needed to be sinking down roots and be developing. And so these parents are hopping around looking for churches when their kids needed to have somebody speaking into their life and encouraging them. If parents think beyond just what their needs are but what their kids need, they won't do stuff like that when their kids are in crucial teenage years. When they've got people that they've been in a church with for 10 years that have that freedom to come in to speak into their child's life, uh, and then they go to somewhere where they're not even known by anybody. They need to think about that, and, and I'm so glad my parents stayed rooted. Um, I, I got these things from Pastor Willie George. that He preached a message on instilling things into kids, and, and, and as far as Philip and what he did, Philip in the, Holy, uh, uh, in the book of Acts, the Bible said, he had four daughters who could prophesy. And he gave me some things that I want to share with you today that you can help these parents to understand that they can be an example before their kids. Why did Philip have four daughters that could prophesy? First, Philip was filled with the Holy Spirit. He got filled with the power of God. And you know what? When you're around people that are filled with the Spirit, it makes those that are not hungry for that. Parents need to be filled with the Spirit so their kids will be hungry for the things of the Spirit. Second of all, Philip was a servant who was submitted to godly leadership in the church. Do you know what? More often than not, Pastor Van, you'd probably agree with this. The kids that are most active and involved in the ministry are kids whose parents are serving in the local church and being involved in some way. When kids see their parents doing it, it's just natural for them to do it. So these parents that you're going to be training and encouraging them, you need to tell them, hey, you need to be involved. Your kids need to see that example. You need to do it for yourself. You need to be pouring into people, but your kids are watching. So Philip, he was a servant, submitted to godly leadership and involved in the church. Acts 8, 5, Philip had a love for lost souls. He heard about Samaria, and he went down and preached the word of God to those people that needed to hear. He cared about the lost. Parents need to demonstrate and live before their kids a love for the lost. Then number four, um, Philip was unselfishly obedient. In Acts chapter 8, the angel of the Lord appeared to Philip and said, Philip, you need to go down. And he, when able, he was able to share with the Ethiopian eunuch. That's right after he's had this great revival in Samaria. Peter and John came because they heard about how good it was. And then when the Spirit of God said, Philip, you need to go, what did Philip do? But God, all these wonderful things are happening. Miracles, glory to God, it's great. I don't want to leave. Peter and John are here now. Nope. Did he do that? Nope. He was unselfishly obedient to what God told him to do. He stepped down. He went to minister to that Ethiopian eunuch. And you know what? He was willing to step outside the box. The next thing he was, he was willing to be uh, follow the Holy Spirit in his thinking. Back in those days, it wasn't acceptable for, this, for um, people outside of the Jewish family to begin to receive the word of God. But Philip was thinking like God was thinking. He was thinking about the lost. He was thinking about all those people around him. So he began to do that. And then you know what happened? A miracle happened in his life. He saw something great happen because Philip did what God told him to do. He was full of faith. And then the Spirit of God transported him right to the next place he needed to be. So those things in Philip's life, he, his daughter saw him being used by God. The next thing I want you to see is you need to make investments into the lives of your kids. You need to be willing to invest in them. My parents... Thank God. They didn't just speak that they believed in what God called me to do. They put money behind what they, 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 they said. When there was conferences like this one going on, every year my parents paid to fly me to a conference where I could learn about how to be a good children's pastor and a good children's worker. At 12 years old, they started sending me across the country so I could go to a conference like that. Pastor Van, it wasn't cheap for me to go to Australia with him, but he was willing to do that to make an investment in my life to show that he believed in me. You may not be able to do things on, on a grand scale, like sending somebody on a trip like that, but there's little things you can do to, to make an investment in your kids. Buy them little books or hand them a tape they can listen to that'll help them grow 
or, or, or even take them out and do something fun with them to let them know that they're special to you and you just want to say that you care about them and you love them. The next thing you need to do is you need to be a good listener. You need to be a good listener. When you have these kids coming around and you start to pour into them, sometimes people just want to talk, 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 talk. But you know what? Sometimes guys like me, when, when we're learning to be used by God, we need somebody that will just listen to us when we begin to say things out. So be a good listener. Pastor Van is a great listener when I needed to talk to him about things. Other people that God's put in my life to be able to, to talk to and they're listening and encouraging me. Number eight, be sensitive to the Holy Spirit in praying for your kids. The Holy Spirit wants to use you to pray for your kids and to pray, pray uh, the, uh, the mysteries of God for them. Sometimes um, I've heard stories before about little people that were encouraging people in their church. Well, one night a, a sixth grade Sunday school teacher was praying. And the Spirit of God began to show them what a young man in their Sunday school class was going to be. And the next day they were able to pull aside and said, you know, Peter, last night I was praying for you. God's got a big plan for your life. You know what? I, I think just maybe God may have called you to be in the ministry. Now, that person, that kid began to cry and say, you know what? I've been feeling God's called me to be an evangelist. You know, that person, that teacher, took the time to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and praying for those kids. Your kids that you're pouring into need you to do that. They need you to be sensitive. Commit your life, number nine, to pouring into the life of others. Commit to live a life where you're developing fruit that remains and you don't just go out and, and try to do it all by yourself. You know what? If I go to the church where I'm at and then when I leave, everything falls apart, do you know what I was doing? I was doing something out of pride and selfish ego. But if I step out from Evangel Temple, if God chooses to send me to another place, that ministry keeps on growing and keeps on happening. You know what? I've done what God's called me to do because I've poured my life into others. I've given myself to others. This year I was at the Hillsong Conference and Paul Scanlon shared a message that was powerfully used by God. He talked about how Elisha, when he was thrown into the ground, the, the, the residue that was on him caused that person to be raised from the dead. You remember that story? Paul said, you know, a lot of times we get excited about that. Woo! The power of God is on him. The power of God is on that guy. Some of you jumped. You were falling asleep. And uh, that, dead, that dead man was thrown in and he came back to life. But Paul said, listen... He said, we in the church, we don't need to go, go to be with Jesus and still carrying some power on us. Jesus came and he emptied himself. He gave what God gave to him and he gave it all away. He challenged us and he said, listen, if you've still got power on you after you, you left, you haven't given away what God's called you to give away. Commit yourself to pour in your life into other people. Commit yourself to say, Lord, when this thing's all said and done with, I want to be like a sponge that every little drop's been squeezed out. I want to keep refilling myself as long as I'm going to be here. I want to keep going to conferences where I'm going to grow and be blessed and be refreshed and encouraged, but I'm going to keep on being poured out. God will keep filling you, but don't leave this life not giving, giving it all away. Give it all up. Commit yourself to pour in your life into other people. Live that kind of life. So you step aside and say, Lord, I'd use what you gave to me. Now I want to tell you two things to encourage you. We've got to equip this next generation. There's a great book that's called The Bridger Generation. And this book talks about a generation of young people born between the age of 19, uh, born in 1977 through 1994. How many of you have heard of this book before? It's by Tom Rainer. It's a great book. You need to read it if you don't have it. This, this book tells about, though, this generation born between 1977 through 1994. It's the second largest people group of uh, a, a generation that we've had in years. The boomers are number one, but the uh, uh, Bridger generation is very close in size to the boomers. You know that 80% um, of people say they accept the uh, accept Jesus into their heart before the age of 19 or earlier. And you know what? From the studies that they've done through this, uh, 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 this generation, if current evangelical trends continue, only 4% of bridgers will be reached for Christ. Do you understand what that means? People that I was born in 1977, 
through up kids that are six years old right now, when they grow up, they're going to be a minority if things continue like they are. Only 4% have been reached for Christ of this Bridger generation. There's young people that need to hear the gospel and commit their life to Jesus Christ. They need to have uh, things focused on them and them being reached. Psalms 127.4 says, Children are a heritage of the Lord. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. Like arrows in the hand of a mighty man, so are children in the days of thy youth. I believe in the last days, we're here standing like the, the prophet of God did, speaking to that king. You know the story about the arrows? And he said, king, take the arrow and shoot it out. And when you shoot it out, that's how you, far you're going to beat back the enemy. Then he said, take the arrows and beat them on the ground. And you know what? The king only beat it on the ground just a few times. And so he only beat back the enemy just a little bit. The prophet of God said, you should have beat those things more times. And you would have beaten back the enemy completely. You know what? The Lord spoke to me about that message of the arrows. Is that we have an opportunity to beat things, pour things, drive things into our kids. And then when we stand up, we stand up like the scripture says, like arrows in the hand of a mighty man. So our children in the days of thy youth, you stand up, you begin to throw them. And then with strength, they go out by the power of God to do what God's called them to do. Who do you think is the best uh, people to influence this generation that needs to be reached for Christ? The kids. The kids are. Who's going to listen to another kid share the gospel? Another kid. They're going to listen to their peers as they go out and begin to share. With this missions program I shared with you about just a few minutes ago, God told me last year when we were on our Russia trip, we had a seven-year-old on our trip, and I saw how God used her sharing the plan of salvation and ministering to other kids. There was one school that she went into, and when they went into the school, her father was told, you can't come in. We're not going to let you preach. We're not going to let you hand out the Bible. Uh, there's nothing you can do uh, in this school. The father was slick, and so he said, you know what? Um, have the kids ever heard an American before? We'd just love to come and talk to your kids. And so they said, no, we've seen adult Americans before. And he pulled it over his daughter, and he said, but have you ever seen an American child? And those principals said, no, 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 we'd love to have an American child talk to our kids. So they brought this seven-year-old into the, to the big assembly hall. They called all the elementary kids into a, a, this assembly and they fill up this room and then this little girl and her dad go and stand up on the platform he's able to stand beside her and hold her hand and you know what she gets up and does she talks about life in america she talks about why she's come on this trip and then you know what by the prompting of the holy spirit she felt like she ought to tell kids about jesus so she said told them the plan of salvation begin to share about how much Jesus loved them. You know what she did? And in school where they weren't even going to let them get up and speak, she gave an invitation, and uh, several hundred kids gave their heart and life to Christ wow. right in the middle of the school in Russia. <laughs> she got up and was used like, like that, and when I saw that, she was more effective than the greatest preacher on our team. When we finished that trip, we were going back home, and all through the time, the Spirit of the Lord just prompted me, there's something I want to tell you about this, there's something I want to tell you about this. I began to ask the Lord, and the Lord said, this is not the only kid that's supposed to come. You're supposed to bring other people with you. I had read in Charisma Magazine several years ago about John Tash and what he does with the, uh, the kids' missions teams, and so I pulled together some resources from that. We started to believe God and, and uh, ask the Lord, how, to, how we could do this. We identified who we wanted to take on our team. This year, we put together a team of five kids. We had a seven, uh, eight-year-old, 10-year-old, 11-year-old, uh, 13-year-old, and a 14-year-old go on our trip. We had five, five young people on our team this year. The trip cost uh, $2,500 a person to be able to go. We couldn't do anything as far as helping them. Uh, we did, were able to do one or two fundraisers that helped a little bit. Those kids were able to generate some of that. We had an offering that raised about half of it. But you know what? Those kids raised the other half of that money. They went on this trip this year. And do you know what happened on that trip? They began to get up and share about what God had done in their life. And you know what happened? Who was the most effective minister of the gospel to speak into those other kids? Those kids were. They'd watch the adults as they shared a little bit. And they'd wait for little 
angel to get up to the microphone or, or wait for Dawn to have a chance to sing and then to share what was in her heart. And then these young people by the droves committed their life to Christ. Our team was broken up because of traveling difficulties and the 10 year old on our team actually got to go to a city that's on the Chinese border. How many of you believe China's about to open for the gospel? She got to go to the Chinese border to a city called Krasnikominsk. The city's closed to outside influence, 100 meters uh, outside of, um, um, uh, kilometers outside of this city. All roads into the city stop. It's a city that, that uh, mines 90% of the world's uranium, from what I understand. Russia influence didn't want people coming into that city to, to get to where the uranium was. So all roads in anyway, uh, 100 kilometers outside the city. They had to go through bumpy mountain roads to get down into the city that they came into. Then they come up on this huge city with high-rise buildings and different stuff like that. A, a city, I think, of uh, 50, 60,000 people. They went in and they put together a meeting and a service. They packed out a crusade hall that could sit somewhere between five and 600 people. From what I'm told, because I wasn't there, there was five or 600 kids outside. And they gave an invitation that night as those young people got up to minister. The young lady that was on our team and others who were a part of the young team ministry. You know what? When they gave an invitation that night, Every single person in the auditorium raised their hand, stood up on their feet, and said, I want to commit my life to Jesus Christ. You know what? These kids can be used by God to do what he's called them to do. They don't have to wait. It's never too early. They can be used by God right now. They're arrows in our hands, but we've got to release them out to do what God's called them to do. We've got to pour this stuff into them and let God pour the stuff into them through us is what I'm trying to say, and then let them go out, release them to do what God's called them to do, and it's going to destroy the power and the work of the enemy. He's going to use them like that. When these kids came back, we had a testimony service, and I, I had seen a level of growth and maturity and, and uh, before we left and then things that they did while we were there. But when these kids came back, my pastor was so great he let two adults share, but guess who got to share the most? We let all five of those kids get up and share what God had done. And do you know what happened? Our church, their eyes were open to what kids can be, what kids can do, what kids can uh, go after when the power of God's on the inside of them. And I, I, I'm standing amazed and waiting to see what God's going to continue to do. We've just gotten back. There's kids chomping at the bit to go on our team next year, ready to be used by God. If you'll allow these kids to be used, I really believe we can see a generation of young people that the enemy's tried to destroy. He's tried to break their hearts. He's tried to stomp their dreams out. We can see them turn back around if we'll equip and train the young people or release them to do what God's called them to do. They're the natural evangelists for this generation. And I believe that we're going to see the word of God fulfilled in the last days. We're going to see sons and daughters begin to move out. What does a kid want to do more than anything? A kid wants to be able to have a freedom to speak. Yeah, they may not even want you to agree with them after it's said, but a kid wants just an opportunity to be heard. When those kids get up, they begin to share those things God's put in their heart. They begin to find the the, the fulfillment that God's going to use me. God's given me an opportunity to be a vessel for him, and I can't wait to see what God's going to do through you as you step out and even greater. Say, Lord, I want more. I want the kids in my church to have more of you and to step out in power to do what he's called them to do. Do you want that? Would you stand and let me just pray for you before we close? Father, we thank you today for your work. We thank you, Lord, for kids that can be equipped for a lifetime of service in your kingdom. Their lives can be changed. Their lives can be directed into newer levels, into a deeper place. Father God, we don't want just the, we, we want nothing of the external. Lord, we want you to move in and take control of the kids' hearts. We want you to captivate them. We want you to love them. We want you to, to reach in them and fill them with your power. Lord God, help us 
to be equippers of this mighty army that you set before us. Help us to do the things that you've called us to do to raise them up so that they can be those sons and daughters that prophesy and are used mightily by the Spirit of God. We thank you today for dreams and visions that are coming to pass even right now. Lord, as children's workers and children's pastors have been on their faces before you and they've asked you for the hearts of their young people, Lord God, we thank you that you'll grant it. We thank you that you'll open doors that no man can shut and we thank you that we're going to see the harvest brought in. We thank you this generation of young people is not going to be overlooked but they're going to be reached with the power of the gospel and we thank you for it Lord in Jesus name. Amen.